Good morning. Thus far, we have looked at medieval art, Romanesque and Gothic, within the borders of modern France. But these stylistic or cultural labels transcend borders, especially since we're not speaking of modern nation states. The city of Strasbourg on the Rhine River has changed political complexion more than once. And it would be foolish, and in some company rash, to say that Strasbourg in the Middle Ages was not French. But I want to show you a famous sculpture from Strasbourg Cathedral. It is the tympanum over the south transept door, a minor door, a smaller door, a smaller piece of sculpture, showing the death of the Virgin and carved about 1230. This truly remarkable narrative sculpture has a characteristic expressivity that I think is not explained simply by its date later in the Gothic period. Although it's rather small, it delivers an outsized emotional punch. The, the heads of the apostles who are present at the death of Mary, and by the way, this is not a scriptural story, this is legend, are compressed, these heads are compressed rather awkwardly against the arch. I think you would agree with me. He, the artist has been determined to get the apostles in there, and there they are, heads pushed against the arch and all pretty much stamped out of a similar style or a similar mold of um, figure type. But the central drama is richly enacted by four full-length and two half-length figures. Mary being laid upon a bed by two apostles with Christ and St. John standing behind the bed and most remarkably Mary Magdalene kneeling in front of it. The robes of these figures are modeled in a classical manner reminiscent of the flowing robes of the figures on the north portal of Chartres, Moses and Abraham, that we looked at but they're infused with much more humanity, more tenderness. And this is because their greater motion is translated into emotion. The sculptor makes the demands of this semicircular composition work for him by allowing it to bend his figures in toward the emotional core of the scene. It should be observed that Christ, uh, miraculously present at the death of his mother, holds a female figure like a small statuette in his left hand. That is the soul of his mother, which he receives. It's quite touching. The Magdalene, who nearly always expresses deep emotion in artistic representations, is wonderfully believable in her grief which we see in her face and feel in her coiled posture beside the bed. When I look at this memorable sculpture, I feel a Nordic, a Germanic spirit at work. I'm quite sure some would argue this, but I feel that in this particular interpretation, the expressivity of it. Well, however that may be, the next work I'm going to show you is completely in that spirit, a creation of a northern spirit or psychological bent that values the release of extreme emotion and permits it to govern the representation of the human body. It is this extraordinary Pietà, a German work carved of wood, now in Bonn, in a museum there, made about 1300. The wood sculpture has been painted, of course, and the polychrome has survived. The rigid, emaciated, tortured, and broken body of Christ is supported by his anguished mother. The compactness of this group was partly dictated by the limitations of the wood the sculptor was working, but it is precisely this compression of form contrasted with disproportionately large expressive heads that makes our emotional response so immediate, so stabbing. 
I use the word Pietà, and you're familiar with it. Most people immediately think of Michelangelo when they think of Pietà, hear the word Pietà. The word means pity. It's as simple as that. But it's a curious fact that this scene in art has no scriptural foundation. It was probably invented in Northern Europe as a kind of omega to the alpha of the innumerable images of the Madonna tenderly holding the Christ child. In my beginning is my end. South of the Alps, in Italy, the Romanesque and Gothic styles also found a home before the resistance to them set in during the Renaissance. One of the most beautiful and monumental architectural complexes in Italy is in Pisa, which was then a rich and important port city on the Arno near the Tyrrhenian Sea. And the richness shows when you look down from the air at this remarkable composition of great buildings. Nearest us, the baptistry, then the cathedral. Behind that, the campanile, the bell tower, the famous leaning tower of Pisa. And to the left, behind the baptistry, a, uh, a large square enclosed area, rectangular area, which is a burial ground called the Campo Santo, the Holy Ground. All of these buildings were constructed between 1053 and 1272. And the tiers of white stone, the arcades and colonnades on the principal buildings are breathtakingly beautiful. The baptistry in the foreground suggests a papal tiara. It's, it's an astonishingly large baptistry. And its immense size reminds us that this sacrament, the sacrament of baptism, is essential to the Christian faith, that it admits the baptized person into the church and that it is the necessary precondition for salvation. The Campo Santo, or holy field just beyond the baptistry, is, as I said, the burial ground. It's a large, open, cloister-like space, surrounded by covered galleries that are decorated not only with tombs but with wall paintings. And the whole of this wonderful complex is known by the evocative name Campo dei Miracoli, Field of Miracles, surely a movie title. Inside the great baptistry is a famous pulpit by an artist named Nicola Pisano. Nicola Pisano designed and carved the Pisa pulpit, as it is known in the baptistry, in 1260. I should say a word about Nicola Pisano. He was born, we don't know, but about 1220 and died about 1278, and he probably came from the south of Italy around 1250 to Tuscany and established himself there as one of the finest sculptors. But he had some knowledge of classical sculpture before he arrived, and he consciously reintroduces or reinvents Roman classical forms for use in his religious sculpture. On this wonderful pulpit, you can, when you're looking at it, you wonder how one gets up, but there's a staircase on the opposite side, or was, and one climbed up to read from the pulpit, and the, the, uh, you, you see the uh, eagle here. That's the lectern, and it was always the St. John's eagle was always used, almost always, as the, as the supporting figure for the lectern, it, for, for, for um, oratory which soars. There are five rectangular marble relief carvings on the pulpit. One of the most impressive of the marble panels is the Adoration of the Magi. Impressive because of the powerful magisterial figures that Nicola designed and carved. The Adoration of the Magi is a monumental panel in many ways, and all of the figures impress us with their dignity and with their physical weight. They're not merely large. They possess what we could call innate gravity, uh, solemnity, qualities appropriate to the sacred subject they reenact. And in this they seem precursors of the figures painted by Giotto more than 40 years later, and like Giotto's figures and the Madonna and the Kings in this panel, have a pronounced and profound sense of the significant. It's a hard word, but by it I mean this inherent weight 
the inherent meaning that it carries. This is a very different panel than in its clarity than the kind of treatment that one might have found, might have expected in late medieval art. The drapery, that is to say the robes of the kings and the Madonna, owes quite a lot to Roman marble carving, except that its sharp angularity is similar to Italo-Byzantine stylization. I want, in your looking at this, I want you to note particularly the horses at the left, the three horses who, uh, are mani who managed to uh, enter the relief, as it were, wonderful heads, wonderful manes, and in particularly the horse's uh, head, which uh, goes downward toward the leg of the uh, magi to the far left. The gifts in the containers that the magi have, you see them, uh, and the, in particular the way the lead ma magus, the lead king, hands his gift to the Christ child, and the Christ child eagerly uh, accepts it from him. We know that Nicola Pisano borrowed the pose of the Madonna here on the right from a Roman sarcophagus then and still in the Campo Santo at Pisa, which is a veritable museum of Roman sculptural uh, sarcophagi. The particular one that Nicola used for inspiration here has the subject of the legend of Hippolytus, and here you see it. The sarcophagus with the legend of Hippolytus, second century AD, uh, in Pisa, in the Campo Santo. Of, of the myth of Hippolytus, um, son of Theseus, I want to point out Phaedra, who is seated here. Phaedra was the much younger second wife of Theseus, and she'd fallen in love with her stepson. He repelled her advances, her pride was wounded, she denounced him to Theseus, claiming that Hippolytus had tried to seduce her. Theseus believed her, banished his son, and prayed to Poseidon for vengeance. Soon after, Hippolytus was riding by the sea when the god sent a monster from the water uh, to bolt, to, that caused the horses to bolt, and Hippolytus was dragged to his death. This theme was very popular on Roman sarcophagi. Incidentally, if you don't already know it, you may be intrigued by the derivation of the word sarcophagus. I'm not a scholar of Latin and Greek and used the word for many years without knowing its meaning. The Romans took it directly from the Greeks. Sarkos means flesh and phagine means to eat. The limestone and marble is a form of limestone of the sarcophagus caused rapid disintegration of the body. The female figure seated at the left edge of the front of the sarcophagus is Phaedra. Theseus is the older man near her standing figure and Hippolytus is in the center listening to the false accusation and his banishment, banishment. and he leaves uh, and the right half shows his uh, horse bolting when the monster appears. Nicola Pisano has reversed the seated Phaedra when he adopted the pose for his Madonna, perhaps to disguise the borrowing, but just as likely for compositional reasons. And he also borrowed the triangular gable or, cor or cornice above her head. At the six corners of the pulpit, above the capitals of the supporting columns, are small statues of the virtues as well as one of John the Baptist. This nude figure is fortitude, one of the so-called cardinal virtues, symbolizing strength, courage, endurance. Nicola based him on the popular mythological hero, Hercules. The lion's skin, which is an attribute of uh, Hercules, reveals the borrowing, reveals the source. But Nicola wasn't trying to hide it, since it was both appropriate and instantly recognizable. The nudity is perhaps surprising at such an early pre-Renaissance date, but is more common than one might think. His model was also probably found on a sarcophagus, but he must have been looking at the Hippolytus that we just looked at on the sarcophagus with Phaedra as well. The Nativity from the Pisa pulpit by Nicola Pisano. The monumental majesty of the reclining Mary presiding like a queen is unforgettable. A and notice that she's immense. If she were to stand up, she'd be taller than the panel is. This is a very large figure shown in hieratic scale, hieratically important, therefore larger. Note that it's a combination scene. It's the nativity, but it's also the Annunciation. Here to the left of the reclining Mary is the Annunciate Mary, and here is the, uh, the angel of the Annunciation, Gabriel. Um, Mary actually, the reclining Mary, actually overlaps herself 
uh, in, in the Annunciation. In the foreground, the midwives wash the child, while behind the birth bed, behind Mary's bed, the infant is already laid in his manger crib. So he exists twice here. And Joseph down in the lower left-hand corner, who is uh, attending and watching the midwives, uh, and again to the upper right-hand side, uh, behind the manger, uh, you have the shepherds, some in the fields, receiving the Annunciation, and some already arriving. These multiple simultaneous narratives are a standard, convenient pictorial device in medieval art, in sculpture as well as in painting, obviously, and indeed continue well into the Renaissance. I wanted to point out before leaving this the, the group of uh, sheep to the lower right, because when any of these artists of the Gothic period deal with animals, painters as well as sculptors, they tend to become much more naturalistic. Human beings, especially those who are involved in divine uh, activity here, who are parts of biblical scenes, are given a certain stylization but the animals are treated with great individuality, uh, just as in paintings flowers and so forth are as well, and they're often among the most charming aspects of these works. Nicola had a son, Giovanni, who shared his genius in sculpture. Both were architects as well, uh, working, for example, on the Pisa Baptistry and the cathedral. They were very, uh, very important artists in both categories, but we know their sculpture much better because one can focus on it in a way you can't on an ongoing building in which many on which many architects worked. Between Nicola and Giovanni Pisano, they created four great pulpits and much other sculpture. Both of them belong to the Gothic, though Nicola is obviously an older figure, but his classicism, his Nicola's classicism, is in striking contrast to his son's art. Giovanni also worked in Pisa, and I want to show you his pulpit for the cathedral. Giovanni Pisano, born about 1248, died sometime after 1314. Here is his nativity, about 1302 to 1311, from the pulpit in the cathedral. You can see, by the way, that it's a curved pulpit, not a polygonal one, so that this scene follows the curve of the architecture, architectural elements themselves. This scene still contains multiple simultaneous narratives, but there are many significant differences between Giovanni's design and Nicola's. Although the Virgin is still hieratically large, her dominance is not as striking as in Nicola's, and our eyes are drawn to her because of the sloping, eye-shaped oval that contains her body. I'm talking about this shape, which is in part, well, I'll, I'll describe it here. The lower part of the shape is marked by her bedclothes, and then our eye is drawn upward at the left by her, the curve of her back and her head, and then the beginning of a grotto-like arc that envelops Mary and the ox and the ass here, and her child, here, to whom she pays very tender maternal attention, more so than in Nicola's rather regal Madonna. This is much more um, human, in a sense, in its response. The overall design is dynamic, with a curvilinear, swaying, swinging line, much, much bowing and stooping and bending of figures, and a scheme of figures that, in some strange idea here, radiates outward from a point in the lower center of the panel. If you were to start about here, at the back of one of the midwives, you see things radiating out. There's a kind of radiant design that he has set up with his many figures, including the sheep, uh, of whom he has more. He has a larger flock uh, than, his, than his father had. Both Pisanos also worked in Siena, and they worked in the cathedral there, the striking uh, black and white marble cathedral at which you'll, sh we shall look for a moment. One of the most beautiful buildings in, uh, in Siena, if you like black and white stripes, uh, most bu beautiful buildings in um, Italy, mid-12th to late 14th century. The, the cathedral's been much altered inside over the years, the nave, uh, for instance, has undergone various uh, changes, but the pavement is original and there are many great things that have been created for this cathedral. Long removed from its place of 
honor as the high altarpiece is one of the greatest of medieval Italian painted altars, the Maestà of Duccio, which I will show you now, but we'll be returning to it uh, in detail later. The Maestà, or Majesty, it means, uh, be painted between 1308 and 1311, one of the most famous of Sienese paintings. Uh, it was in the cathedral, was on the high altar. It is now in the museum of the cathedral known as the uh, Museum of the Cathedral Works, the Museo dell'Opera Metropolitana. Uh, we're looking at the front side of a two-sided altarpiece, very, very large altarpiece, and we'll look at it later in our lectures in the continuum of painting in Siena. Now, I want to take at this point uh, the opportunity to look at three great paintings of a single subject. So I'm sort of switching gears here, but we're still in European art, now in Italy, Gothic art in Italy, and I want to show you three paintings of the Madonna enthroned with Christ child and angels, done during a period of only 25 to 30 years. The artists are Cimabue, Duccio, and Giotto. The monumental paintings, and they're all large, are today all in a single museum, the Uffizi in Florence. Talk about an embarrassment of riches. Here is the Cimabue, C-I-M-A-B-U-E, the name by which he is known. Many Italian artists are known by nicknames or short names. And uh, Cimabue, about whom we know really relatively little, uh, except that he was obviously a very great artist, um, but we don't have much biographical detail. But this Madonna, which is sometimes called the Santa Trinita Madonna because of the church for which it was painted uh, in Florence, is was painted in the 1280s, probably, uh, and is 12 feet 7 inches high. This is a big work, and it is the stylistic heir to the ongoing Byzantine tradition, the style of the Eastern Catholic Church, centered in Constantinople, in the poses, the symmetry, the decorative details, it speaks the language of what contemporary Italians called the Greek manner, and they met Byzantine art from the other side of the Adriatic. But no panel painting in the East had dared to paint such a huge, take over on such a huge size. Uh, that was left to mosaic artists, not painters. And rarely had Byzantine artists achieved such formal simplicity and directness, resulting in a more personal connection with the viewer. Italo-Byzantine art is the, is the term that is applied to this Eastern flavored style. And it was dominant in Italian painting in the 12th and through most of the 13th century. Cimabue moves away from this dominant style even while he incorporates elements of it. Even the pointed gable of this panel is a break with Byzantine art. It is not found there. It is Gothic. Architecture, the architectural throne, uh, especially at the bottom where you see these concavities, in a, the concavity in the center, uh, where it uh, sort of houses a couple of prophets down there, uh, emphasizes a, a solidity which is unexpected, especially in a painting which is still dominated by gold ground, uh, which is not realistic, it puts it in an abstract mystical uh, frame, and yet that architecture has tremendous uh, credibility, uh, decorative though it is, and a lot of that comes from that curve, that cusp that he cuts into the bottom of it. As I said, it came from, it was painted for the Church of Santa Trinita in Florence. Um, the angels, uh, if you look at the angels flanking this, you see that they are, as it were, quite mature angels uh, and very uh, in charge of themselves, in charge of their, uh, their acts. Uh, they stand there supporting the throne, it seems. They hold it from the sides and they overlap one another um, going sort of straight up the, the throne. By the way, I'm looking at the, the Madonna's robe. It must, the blue her robe looks black in most reproductions because the blue that was used to paint it was an expensive color and it was a color that frequently changed color or got damaged. In one way or another, blues frequently darken and are no longer the rich blue they once were. The second of the two Madonnas is a, quite a contrast. It is by Duccio, whom I just mentioned with His Majesty in the Cathedral. Um, his Madonna enthroned, which when you first look at it, compared to the monumental uh, painting by Cimabue, seems delicate. 
uh, it, it, uh, I think it's seen in reproduction. Most people would guess that it's smaller than by the one by Chimabue, but it's nearly 15 feet high. It's higher. It's 14 feet 8 inches. Uh, it is the difference in style that might make us mis think that it was uh, smaller. Because Duccio is a far more lyrical painter, and that lyricism is expressed through small figures, more linear curves, fewer massive shapes, and a gentle expression both in gesture and in facial expression. The way the figures are separated, the angels one from another makes a difference too. They don't overlap each other, they float against the gold ground, and their colors are exquisite utterly exquisite. And, and you're, you're instantly aware when you see them together, the Chimabue in this, the Chimabue's eight standing angels are packed in a cascade of wings uh, and uh, a stack uh, of heads, while Duccio's instead uh, are uh, floating uh, in, the, uh, in the ground that you, that you have here. Duccio has um, also made a great deal of uh, lyrical quality with the cloth that hangs behind the Madonna. Um, you almost get the feeling that, it, that it's cut down, but that's the halo, of course, that is superimposed uh, upon it. Chimabue's angels, by the way, looked directly at us, while Duccio's look at the Madonna and child, another difference of intent and of expression. Duccio's throne, by the way, is placed on a slight diagonal, unlike Chimabue's. Uh, instead of front, absolute frontality, a slight diagonal, which again introduces a, a, a note of relaxation into it. In art historical literature, uh, this painting is often uh, mistakenly called the Ruchulai Madonna, as though it had been commissioned by the Ruchulai family, but uh, it's only because it was later moved into their chapel in Santa Maria Novella in Florence that it got that name. They did not commission it. The third I'm going to show you is the famous Giotto, Madonna enthroned. Uh, it is the Ognisanti Madonna of about 1310. It's only 10 feet 8 inches high. Uh, from the Church of All Saints, or Ognisanti, in Florence. This great painting of the Madonna and Child represents the greatest stylistic advance, quotes around advance, but it is the smallest of the three. By advance, I do not want you to understand improvement or better. I refer only to the technical advances made by Giotto, which are found here. First, the architecture of the throne wraps around. It's real architecture. It's three-dimensional. encloses the Madonna and child completely. She sits within it. Second, her head is held erect, upright, not that bend of both Cimabue and Duccio, that lean of the head, upright, therefore less stylized. It doesn't fall into a stylized tradition. It's less part of an automatic tradition. And the result is that we feel more convinced that she looks at us, that there is a shared humanity between the painted Madonna and us. That connection is strong and new. Third, the angels and saints that flank the throne while crowded overlap with greater naturalness, and moreover, they seem to belong to a ground plane rather than just stacking up to side. There's more variety. The two angels who kneel in front, wonderful angels, possess a, a really noble bearing as they kneel beside the steps that is nowhere to be found, I think, in the otherwise superb angels of, of Cimabue and Duccio. Uh, but in general, the whole sense of space, despite the gold background, which tends to deny space, is created by the figures and by the great architectural uh, throne that the artist has, uh, has produced here. In our next meeting, we will begin not with Duccio, who, as I already mentioned, I will reserve to show with other Sienese artists, but with Giotto, the great precursor of the Renaissance in Italy. Thank you for your attention.